What is biofilm? Biofilms are very well structured layers of microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, and other microorganisms that form in wet places. In your house, you might notice, for example, mold in your shower. You might notice slime in a wet place in your garden. They're also biofilms, these complex organized layers that are basically defense systems for bacteria. Dental plaque is a biofilm that we all know very well, and we also struggle with trying to remove it really well. And in fact, there's some really nice parallels between the problems of dental plaque and the problems of biofilms when they're in medical and dental equipment. How does biofilm affect human health? When biofilms are found inside dental equipment, there are several conditions which have been shown to be linked to the organisms which grow in the biofilm. One that most people have heard about is Legionella pneumophila, which can cause Legionnaire's disease, but also a less serious condition called Pontiac fever that many people who get mistake for just a case of the flu. However, in dental practice today, many of our patients are more medically frail. They're older, they're diabetic, they might have been smokers. These patients have compromised immune systems, so they're much more prone to infections from things in aerosols that we generate when we use an ultrasonic scaler or a high-speed drill. These aerosols transmit the organisms from the dental unit water biofilm into the air and patients breathe them in, as well as dental staff. So both staff and patients are at risk from these organisms and that's been documented in a range of studies and also case reports in the literature. What are the findings from research in terms of water quality in dental water lines? Over the past 25 years, we've done a range of field studies measuring levels of bacteria in water in dental practices across the east coast of Australia. What we've actually found is very consistent with what's been reported in the literature previously for the United States, for Europe and for the UK. And that is that in dental practices that do no active treatment, no flushing, no chemical additives to the water, the levels of bacteria in the water exiting the water lines is incredibly high and well above the threshold level of 200 colony forming units per mil, which is recommended by the Australian Dental Association and that is used as a guide to medical water quality. We've also found variations between brands of dental chair. We've found variations between different protocols for chemical actives. And we've found that when practices are doing continuous chemical treatment, and they're also doing some periodic shock treatment and they're monitoring, their levels are in fact incredibly low and they're meeting the requirements. But we're talking really only about one in five practices. So most practices are not looking and they're not probably aware they've actually got the problem in the first place. Is the input water quality of the dental unit the same as the exit quality from the dental unit? It would be a wonderful thing if the water we fed into the dental chair was exactly the same high quality as the water that came out, but unfortunately that's exactly not the case. And the reason is that inside the dental chair are several meters of very, very small tubing, half a millimeter, one millimeter. And there's a large surface area and the water flows actually quite slowly. So there's lots of opportunity for the water to stagnate. We all know what happens to water when it stagnates. The quality goes down. And if there's things like chlorine present, for example, from tap water, that chlorine basically gasses off or becomes inactive. So unfortunately, if we don't do some active treatment, the quality of exit water is not the same as the quality of the input water, it's much worse. In fact, one could almost say that dental unit water quality is so poor, it's no wonder when you drink from the dental cup that you have to spit it out into the spittoon. Why is it important to test your water lines on a regular basis? With different types of tubing and different types of designs inside a dental chair and different quality of water being fed in, we have a fairly complex system 
that we need to individually measure the performance of. So each practice in each location with different climate, different qualities of water being fed in is its own little experiment. So if you don't actually test the individual chair in your practice, you simply won't know how it's performing. Why is it important to do a shock treatment? Shock treatments are designed to detach and break up biofilm, whereas continuous chemical treatments are designed to slow down or suppress the growth of bacteria. Once the bacteria and other organisms have formed into a complex biofilm, this is their natural way of protecting themselves. It's a little bit like people herding together to protect themselves from attacking forces. So bacteria are much more difficult to kill when they're in a biofilm. So we need a specific intervention to detach and break up the biofilm. And this is what a shock treatment actually does. It breaks the biofilm up physically so we can then rinse it through and leave a clean surface behind. Can bleach solution then be considered a shock treatment? While some people have used ordinary domestic bleach for a shock treatment, I've got some concerns with that. Research that my group have, has done has shown lots of problems with the stability of domestic bleach. For example, exposure to light, degradation because of temperature, and even just time. In other words, unless you test the available free chlorine in domestic bleach, you actually don't know if it's available or active at all. Unfortunately, domestic bleach is a bit of an unknown. When you get it, you don't even know how long it's been sitting in the warehouse or on the shelf at the supermarket. So it's a bit of an unknown. When we use a designated product designed for biofilm disruption and removal or shock treatment, we know it's chemically active. So the efficacy is predictable. Domestic bleach is not predictable. Also, it can interact with the control blocks found in some dental chairs and cause quite severe corrosion. So you wouldn't use it unless you actually were told by the manufacturer that it was compatible with your dental unit's control blocks. Once the water lines are clean, how do we then maintain the water lines? Once we've established a clean environment inside the tubing of the dental chair, we need a chemical additive which will either be actively antimicrobial or will stop organisms from replicating. And there are a range of different chemicals that can do that. Where they differ is in how they work, how quickly they work and how stable they are. Some things which are quite good as antimicrobials might have fairly poor stability. Other things might not work as well, but they might be much better over the longer term. And that's why most products actually combine a couple of different agents together to get an ideal mix of activity and stability. Are we going to see some changes in terms of regulations around water testing with the new ADA guidelines? The ADA guidelines are based on evidence. And when we review them, we take the latest evidence into account as we update and revise the guidelines. So in line with that, given a lot of recent evidence in the last four or five years about bacterial levels in dental unit water lines, we've recommended that people start to measure. And if they find from measuring that the levels are high, that they then intervene with a shock treatment and then measure again. By doing this, you can actually individually sort out the correct protocol for each chair in your practice. The water line that's used the least in the chair that's used the least in your practice will have the worst biofilm. So that's a logical place to start testing. Go for the area where we know the biofilm problem is going to be the greatest. So we talk about a protocol around testing and then bringing back a shock treatment and then retesting as part of the internal regular monitoring and maintenance of a chair in a dental practice. This is something which we've not talked about very much in previous guidelines, but I think it's a very good and important addition to what we should be doing to ensure the quality of dental practice in Australia. The white tablets that are used for dental units are often taken out of the packaging and then dropped in with the hands. Are there any issues with that? 
One of the things we need to bear in mind is that if we handle things like the dosing tablets that are put into the bottle, we're actually going to inoculate organisms from the skin into the bottle. And that's why we find staphylococci from the skin inside dental unit water lines. That's how they got there. So people are never supposed to handle those tablets with their bare fingers. And in fact, the whole system of hygiene around those bottles is very, very important. If we see layers of biofilm growing inside the bottles, those bottles need to be cleaned out. In many chairs, we actually recommend taking the bottles off and leaving them dry, inverted overnight, so biofilm doesn't grow in them. But it's also important to actually have read and followed the manufacturer's instructions. Sometimes we see when people use tablet systems, they actually haven't read the instructions, which often say you also need to shock and you also need to do monitoring. They just do one part and then they neglect to do other things. For example, doing physical flushing of the water lines as well. And when we've noticed situations where patients are contracting Legionella infections from dental practice, inevitably it's one of these little parts of forgetting which has been occurring. So please read and follow the manufacturer's instructions because if you don't, you're not going to end up with a system that's going to be compliant. If there are dental units that are plumbed to town water, how do you perform a shock treatment? So if we have a dental unit which is physically connected into the reticulated or town water, there are a couple of things you can do. Some of those dental chairs come with dosing bottles so chemicals can be added. But you can also get retrofitted, and it's not that difficult to do, some external bottles. So you can actually switch to the external bottle, which is a great way of being able to use a chemical additive either continuously or for a periodic shock treatment. Talk to the people who service your dental equipment because these are very, very straightforward aftermarket additions. The water is simply driven into the chair by compressed air. And of course, it's easy to get compressed air connections from inside the dental unit. So it's not a difficult thing to do. And it's something that we would certainly recommend that people think about doing.